Good morning, Crossroads. Anybody out there? How y'all doing this morning? Y'all ready to worship? Yes, sir. Stand and sing with us. solid ground nations rise and fall kingdoms once strong now shaken we trust forever in your name the name of Jesus yes we do we trust the name of Jesus you are the only king forever Mighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. We are victorious. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. Every knee will bow, yes we will bow down. We bring our expectations, hope is anchored in your name, in the name of Jesus. Banners high, lift them high.
You sought me when I was low A wanderer on a broken road And shame shackled my heart in doubt I was lost in sin, but you brought me out. Your voice shattered the dead of night with just one breath. Every wrong's made right. Now my soul in victory Saved from harm Shouts I'm free, I'm free In my Savior's arms Yes, I'm free, I'm free In my Savior's arms And
Amen. Amen. Hey, uh, thank you guys so much for being here. We're going to dismiss our children to the Outback with their leaders. So 3K through 5th grade, um, come on down. And as they are going out, um, uh, just one thing to say this morning, which is simply this. He was going to preach for a minute, I thought. Uh, we are so glad that you're here. If you're our guest today, if you've not been here before, or if you've been here several times but you've never filled out a welcome card, we would love to have a welcome card filled out. We're not going to bombard you, but we would like to give you a gift. And um, that gift um, will be a, a really neat, usable uh, gift. So please stop by the welcome table uh, on your way out today. Fill out a card and get a gift from us. I was thinking we were singing that song that some of us in the room today, we may feel like we are uh, the wanderer on the broken road. And um, that sometimes when we get on that broken road and we're wandering around, um, we don't feel like we deserve anything else. We feel like we deserve to stay on that broken road, right? And um, the, the reality is that that's not what God's plan is for, for us. Uh, I'm not saying he'll take you off the broken road, but I'm will, I, will, I am saying he will walk with you down that broken road. And, um, you know, we believe that God is alive. And because we believe that God is alive, we believe that he made a way. And, and listen, it's not a secret. He didn't make a way and he's trying to hide it from you. And you got to figure out where it is and what it is. That's not what it is at all. He wants to show you the way that he made for you. And so this morning, my prayer is that you will hear from God. You will see whatever, wherever you are. You may be in that low place. You may be on that broken road. But God has a way, way for you. And he wants to show you what that way is today. And so I pray that we will hear from him uh, this morning. So as we continue to worship um, and we sing about wanting more of God, make that your prayer. God, I I'm, I'm in this place, or I'm in a good place, or I'm in whatever. But whatever place I'm in, I want more of you. I want to see you face to face. Let's continue to worship.
is not by my own earning to have the helper by my side. The gift was fully purchased when the Lamb was crucified. So now freely I can ask Him, for His blood has washed me clean. Let the dove of heaven rest upon the Christ in me. Let the dove of heaven rest upon the Christ in me. in the Psalms um, and I came across same eight, Psalm 84 it says better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere but I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked for the Lord God is a sun and shield the Lord bestows favor and honor no good thing does he withhold for those whose walk is blameless Lord God almighty blessed is the one who trusts in you Don't be here today just to say you went to church. If you were here last week, we got to experience God's presence in just a thick way. Um, and I'm not satisfied with just a little bit. I want all. I want all that we can have. So no Sunday is business as usual. Don't get lost in the, the day in and day out just hardships of life. It says better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. Remember, if you know Jesus, remember where you're heading. Like, 
That's our hope. That's our future. So today, if you would, just pray with me. And if, if your heart's not in it, sometimes it's not. But God can change our hearts. So just pray with me. God, thank you for who you are. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the work that, that you've been doing for so long, but especially just lately. God, we want as much of you as we can get for the rest of our lives. Don't let us be satisfied. Don't let us be satisfied with, with what happened yesterday or what happened last week. Help us to look, look forward and look up. Look up to you, God. You're why we're here. We don't care about any of this other stuff. We want to hear about you, but we want to hear from you. So God, today, just forgive us for falling into the just the rut. God, do something in us today. We surrender to you. We submit to you. We love you and we praise you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may have a seat. Thank you guys for, <clears throat> for being here today. We um, are in our uh, study that we're calling Lessons from a Messy Church, 1 Corinthians. And um, we're going to be diving back in as we walk through the New Testament from Matthew to Revelation. Um, unless God changes my mind, we'll hit Revelation, go to Genesis and walk through. So I don't know, sometime around 2045-ish, we'll get through with the Bible maybe. Um, but, um, but we want to walk through and see what God would say to us as we look at the entirety of the New Testament um, together. And I, I'm really excited about what God is doing, what God has done so far. This morning, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and we're going to be looking at verses 10 through 23, um, and um, I will read and you follow along. Now, if you have your copy of God's Word, great. Look it up. If you need a copy of God's Word, there's one on the back shelf at the bottom. Uh, you can just borrow that, or if you don't have a Bible, you can take that home with you. That's fine. It's the New Testaments are back there. Um, that's what they're for. Uh, and then, of course, you have your phone, and that's one positive thing about technology. We have the Bible on our phone. Or you can just look forward at the screens, and you can follow along that way. But I'll read, and you follow along. And here's what it says. Paul says, because of God's grace to me, I have laid the foundation like an expert builder. Now, others are building on it, but whoever is building on this foundation must be very careful. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, Jesus Christ. Anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, a better translation is um, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw. But on the judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives, that builder will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames." Don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives in you? God will destroy. God will destroy anyone who destroys this temple. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. Stop deceiving yourselves. If you think you're wise by the world's standards, you need to become a fool to be truly wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. As the scriptures say, he traps the wise in the snare of their own cleverness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise. He knows they are worthless. So don't boast about following a particular human leader, for everything belongs to you. Whether Paul or Apollos or Peter or the world or life and death or the present and the future, everything belongs to you. And you belong to Christ. And Christ belongs to God. We don't know the origin of the story. We don't know when it was, when it was originally um, used for the first time. We do, however, know that the story was printed for the first time in the early 1800s. 
Now, it's a story that is still told today. That's a long time for a story to be told, right? But it's a story that since the early 1800s, at least, it's been read um, to children. It's been taught to children. You have read it. You have uh, told the story, every one of you, to your children, and it was told to you. It's been passed down. And it is a story that we think of as just a children's story. But what we don't really realize sometimes is we are teaching through this story, a very valuable lesson. And that is, it is important, not only what you build on, but what you build with. It's very, very important that what you build on and what you build with matters. It makes a difference. Now, what we just read, Paul talks about building. I don't believe that Paul knew this story. I don't, I really don't think he did know the story. However, I'm not so sure that the the writer of the story, whoever created the story, I'm not so sure that they didn't um, take some cues uh, as they were writing it from Jesus' references to being built on the sand or being built on the rock. I'm not so sure they didn't take some cues from Paul when he said, build on a firm foundation. I'm just not so sure. Now, I don't have to bore you with the details of the story, but I will this morning, and I'll share a little quick summary of the story. See, there were these three little pigs, and the three little pigs decided to build three little houses, and the first little pig said, I'm going to build my house out of straw. I'm going to cut some corners. I'm going to save some dough. I'm going to build my house out of straw, and so he did. He went to work. He built it. It was finished first. The second little pig said, you know, I'm not going to be like my brother. I'm not going to cut that many corners. Straw's pretty bad. I'm going to build mine out of some hay, some, something a little bit thicker. I'm going to build it out of something a little more sturdy. And he did. This little pig said, listen, y'all can do whatever you want to. I'm not cutting any corners. I'm going all in. This is, this is for life. This is my house. I'm going to retire in this bad boy. And so I'm going to build a firm foundation. And I'm going to build a uh, house out of some bricks. You know what happened, right? The big, bad, oh, that's weak, people. Come on. The big, bad wife. <laughs> wife? Did he say wife? <laughs> oh, lie. I thought he said wife. The big, bad wife. That's a whole different story. No. <clears throat> Look, April's not feeling well this morning, and she is laughing right now. Um, listen, um, the big bad wolf comes, and he says, little pigs, here's what's going to happen. You just, just come on out. He goes to the first, just come on out. Save some time. Those don't go through the charade. Just come on out. And the pigs, no, no, no. You want me, you come get me. So he huffs, and he puffs, and he blows the straw house down, right? Just, it was easy, right? And the little pig runs out the back door and runs to his brother's house, and he knocks on the door, and he's like, let me in. He does. So the big bad wolf goes over, hey, guys, come on, just, let's just stop all the madness. Just come out. No, we're not coming out. He puffs and he puffs. He blows the house down. They run. They knock on the door of the third brother's house. That if, this, if it was me writing the story, right, that's where the story would have ended. There would have been like, you know, Boston butt barbecue for the wolf. Because I would have said, no, you had your chance. You wanted to cut corners. You, you made your bed. Now you got to lie in it, right? That's what I would do because I'm mean. But he didn't. He opened the door, let him in. The wolf comes. He huffs and he puffs and he puffs and he huffs and he huffs and he puffs. And he, and he tries with all his might to blow the house down, but he can't because it is, it is made out of sturdy stuff, right? It's made out of something that will last. And, and today, when we look at this, uh, what Paul is telling us, he's saying essentially the same thing about our spiritual life. If you want your spiritual life, if you want it to last, if you want something that's going to matter, if you want something that's going to make a difference, you not only have to build on the right foundation, but you have to build with the right stuff. Because what you build with, what you build on, and what you build with matters. And so Paul starts out by first saying, listen, we must depend on God's grace. If everything I'm about to tell you is true, if everything I'm about to show you in the following uh, verses is right, here's the deal. Um, We've got to depend on God's grace because Paul knew his standing as the temple. See, remember in verse nine, he ends up by saying, hey, you guys, you are the build, you're God's building." 
That was probably kind of strange to them in that time. It's kind of strange to us, if you've not been in church before, to think of yourself as a building. I know I look like I'm big as a house, but I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a little guy. So to think of a think of a house, a building that I don't think of myself that way. You don't think of yourself that way. But Paul says at the end of uh, at, at the end of verse nine, hey, you are God's building, and now he's going to elaborate on that by saying, listen, if. Um, If you are going to understand your standing as the temple or the building of God, it is based on grace. It is based on undeserved favor. You didn't do anything to earn it. You got to remember that. As we move forward, as, as as I unfold the rest of the letter, Paul says, it is important. It is imperative. You have to understand that everything you have and everything you are, your standing with God is based on God's grace. It's, you can't earn it. You don't deserve it. I look at my life and I think, man, my life is where it is. It's not because of me. It's not because I'm good. It's not because I did something of value. It's because God's grace. God just gives us grace. We don't deserve it. And he's reminding these Corinthians of that. He says, listen, you, you are God's temple. And as God's temple, um, you have to remember that it's not because of who you are. It's because of who he is. It's because of his grace. Because if you start thinking you've done something, then you get puffed up and pride sneaks in. And that just ruins the whole thing. Now, he's talking about being a, the temple. And, and for some of us, that's a weird concept to think about. But you've got to think in Paul's terms what he's talking about. So in the Jewish culture, the, the, uh, the temple was a massive structure. And it had all kinds of, of things. It had porticos. I don't even know what that is. It had porticos. It had inner courts and outer courts. But it had in it the holy of holies. That was where the priests would go. And they would be alone with God to make sacrifices for the people. I mean, this was a big deal because if the priest did something wrong, if the priest did something unworthy, if the priest did something that was unacceptable, then God could strike them dead. So they tied a rope to their ankle and on it were were bells and they would hear the priest moving around because they would hear the bells jingle. If the bells stopped jingling, they knew something went wrong and they would grab the rope and they would just drag him out. Now, that sounds kind of kind of crazy, but that's the only way because nobody could go behind the curtain. Nobody could go behind the veil except the priest. There was a veil separating man and God. But Paul is saying, well, what happened on the cross was, remember when Jesus dies on the cross, one of the things the Bible teaches us is that the curtain, the veil, that big, thick, heavy thing, massive, tore from top to bottom, not bottom to top. No man can take credit for it. It tore from top to bottom. And when it tore from top to bottom, the separation between man and God no longer existed. And now when you say yes to Jesus, guess what happens? The Holy Spirit that we just sang about, and please do not act like the Holy Spirit is less than. It's not, there's no tiered system. It's not God, Jesus, Holy Spirit. It's God, Jesus, Holy Spirit. I mean, there, it's one. The Holy Spirit is fully God. And that fully God comes to live inside of you. And when he comes to live inside of you, guess what? That's where God is. And that's the temple because we don't have to go to a priest or a mediator. We can go straight to the source. We can go straight to the father and we can pray to the father through the Holy Spirit because we have a relationship with Jesus and the Holy Spirit of God lives in us. And so that's what he, when he says, Hey guys, you are You are the temple, and because you're the temple, that doesn't mean that you have some, you know, something that you can rely on yourself about. Nope, because you're the temple, that means we rely on God's grace more. We depend on God's grace. And he says, so, as we depend on God's grace, we have to remember that Christ is the foundation. That Christ is the foundation. There is... Um, one true foundation. And if the church is not built on that foundation, it is not the church at all. If it's not built on the foundation of Jesus Christ alone, it is not the church at all. So if you're visiting a church, if you're going to another church, if you have relatives in a church, how do you know if that church is built on the foundation of Jesus Christ? How do you know that? How do you figure that out? Well, there's a couple of ways. First, you can ask to see a statement of faith or a, a, what here we call it what we believe. And we have it on the website and we can hand you one. I mean, we have what, what we believe. That's one way that you can do it. 
um, it should state in there somewhere, and it shouldn't be hidden. You shouldn't have to search very long for it, but it should have somewhere in there that, that this church believes in Jesus Christ as the, as the one true God. This church believes that Jesus Christ is the way to salvation because this church is built, or that church is built on Jesus Christ as the foundation. That's the way you know. And how else can you know? Well, you can, you can, you can watch, right? Because it's easy to write something on a piece of paper. It's another thing to, to watch somebody do it. What does the pastor preach? What do the people do? Watch, listen to what they say. Observe what's going on. That's how we know that, that something is built on a foundation because we do know that there are churches out there. There are um, people out there who build their life on something else other than the foundation of Jesus Christ. See, Paul went to Corinth and he laid the foundation for the church in Corinth. And he knew that other people were going to come along and they were going to build on that foundation that he had laid. And that's why Paul at one point says, listen, if anybody comes to you preaching another gospel other than the one I've already preached, even if I myself, Paul, come back and preach a different gospel, then that person should be destroyed. That, that person should not be listened to. That person should be um, removed immediately because we built the foundation on Jesus Christ or we laid the foundation on Jesus Christ and everything we build on that foundation has to be built with the right intentions, the right motivations, the right thing. Because Paul says he knew that some would come and they would try to build something on that foundation in an unworthy manner. He knew that would happen. And so he's warning them ahead of time that this is going to happen. He started it on the right foundation. He, he wanted it to be started off on the right foundation of Jesus Christ, but he knew some would come along. And so he gives us, he gives them three ways to build on that foundation. He said, you can build on the foundation of Jesus Christ with work that is worthy, work that is wasted, or work that gets wiped out. You can build on that foundation with work that is worthy, work that is wasted, or work that gets wiped out. He says, first, you can build with gold, silver, or as I said, a better translation is precious stones. Because when you say jewels, what do you think about? You think gold, silver, diamonds, rubies, emeralds, right? Well, that's not what he's saying. He's saying gold, silver, marble, granite, right? Precious stones. Things that you would want to build a building out of. Something that's solid, something that's going to last. Now, I know some people say, well, wait a second. Um, you mean this is a physical building? Well, not in essence, but what he's saying is that these things are good things, right? Gold, silver, precious stones. These are good things. If you were building, he's making this comparison. If you were building a literal building, that's what you would want it built out of. Well, if you're laying a foundation in Christ, everything you build on it, we want it to be built like we were building something very good, something uh, of value that we that will survive when, and not just survive, but are acceptable to God. Because he says, guess what? It's going to be tested even tested with fire. Now, some of you say, well, look, gold and silver, when you put it in fire, it, it's not going to stay the same. Right, it's not. It's going to melt down. But guess what? It doesn't go away. It only becomes more pure. It only becomes more refined in the fire. So if we build on the foundation of, that, of Christ, if we start to build on it and we build with these good things in mind, if we're building the right way, the right motivation, the right heart, we're building things for the kingdom that are going to last, guess what? No matter what the testing is, it's going to stand the test and it's only going to get more pure and more bright. And Paul then moves to the work that is wasted. Many, many people believe they are serving God, but they are doing it in an unworthy manner. And in eternity, they will see in reality that, that they have done nothing for the Lord. There's lots of people out there who 
are in churches every time the doors are open and they're doing all this work and they think in their mind that God, they're giving an acceptable sacrifice to God. They're giving acceptable work to God. But the reality is they're not because they're doing it for their own, uh, their own glory. They're doing it for the, with the wrong heart. They're doing it so they get pats on the back. They're doing it so people, so they will be seen. They're doing it so they can get elected. They're doing, I mean, I don't know. They're doing it for all kinds of reasons, but they're not doing it for the right reason. They're not doing it to bring glory and honor back to God. They're not doing it so the kingdom can be, can be advanced. And Paul says, hey, all that stuff is wasted because at the end, when it's tested in fire, guess what? It burns up. When the big bad wolf shows up at the door and blows, guess what? It blows away. It's useless. It doesn't mean anything. Now, what are some of those things? Well, he, just I'll give you a couple, and these are all personal, and if you want to have a conversation about them later, we can, but they're really not up for argument as far as I'm concerned. One thing that I think is going to be burned up is the prosperity gospel. The prosperity gospel is going to be burned up. When someone teaches... They're trying to lay on this foundation of Christ that anything you need, anything you want, all you do is pray for it. You have, God owns everything, and God wants you to have everything. Well, God does own everything because does God want me to have everything? No, you know why? Because it wouldn't be good in my hands to have everything. But if you just pray for it, and if you pray and you don't get it, that just means you're not praying hard enough, you don't have enough faith. They never come to the conclusion, which is odd to me, that maybe God says, you know what? That's not right for you right now. That's not the time. Doesn't mean God doesn't answer prayers. God doesn't mean that God won't give you things that you need. I, I can assure you in my life, when we were, Jerry and I were first married, <clears throat> there was a time that came. I mean, we were, I'm talking about, we, we were so poor, we couldn't pay attention. And we had to pay rent and we didn't have it. And I went to my, I uh, was praying, God, I don't know what I'm going to do. Just, oh, I trust you, you know. Went to my little campus mailbox, opened it up. There was an envelope, no name on it, exact amount of rent in there. Does God do things like that? Absolutely. But you know what he didn't do? I didn't open it up to a million dollars, right? The prosperity gospel is all about right now. It's all about this moment. And guess what it does? It makes the gospel about me. It's not about you. How many times do we say that, Right? All the times. It's not about you. Prosperity gospel. I'll tell you something else that I think is going to be burned up. Over preaching over a, a too much about politics. It's going to be burned up. You know why? Because the same reason. It makes the gospel about what you want. Like, if I hear one more person tell me, you can't be this and be a Christian. You can't be that. And be, can't be red and be a Christian. Can't be blue and be a Christian. Can't be libertarian. I don't know what color they are. Green? I, I don't know. Can't be any of that and be a Christian. And the pastors that get up and, and preach a whole message just about politics, it's going to be burned up. It's going to be burned up. You know why? Because whoever's in Washington, that's temporary. That's temporary. That's not eternal. And guess what? Whoever's in Washington, Jesus Christ is still on the throne. Does that mean that I'm telling you that politics is not important? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Should you vote? Absolutely you should vote. Should you vote for whoever you pray about and think in, in your heart and mind is the best candidate? Yes. Should you look at what they believe and compare that to Scripture and then vote your conscience? Absolutely you should. That is absolutely not what I'm saying. But when we get up in this sacred pulpit, when we get up in this, because bringing the gospel is a, is a wholly important thing. And when we make it more about who is, who is running for office than we do about Jesus, there's a problem. There's a problem. And guess what? It burns up. At the end of the day, it burns up. Is it important who runs the country? Of course it is. Is it important who's in the, in the, in the governor's mansion? Of course it is. Is it important who is in, your, uh, in, in all your precincts and all those things? Of course it is. Should you, if you are called, get involved in politics? Absolutely you should. But should I get up here and make my sermons more about who's running for office than I do about Jesus? Absolutely not. Because that's not what it's about. And it will burn up. And Paul is saying, listen, anything you do that's not for the kingdom is wasted. It's wasted. It is a waste of your time and it is a waste of God's time. And here's the scary part. 
Paul says it. It's not that they're not saved. They're saved. It's just that one day when they stand before Jesus, they will have nothing to offer him. Nothing. Now, look, this is the scariest part for me as a pastor. Not for you, but for my own self. Here's why. Because I realize what, <clears throat> I realize what Jesus has done for me. Just the weight of my sin alone on somebody's shoulders humbles me to the point that I can't even imagine what my sin did to Jesus. And the only thing I have, I, I have nothing to offer Jesus. Nothing. But in his grace, all the things that I do, that I build, that are for the kingdom, that are done in the right way, with the right heart, the right motivation, guess what? I'm going to receive a crown. Paul said, you'll get a reward. I'm going to receive a crown. And then it, it doesn't even come close to what Jesus deserves. But I get then to turn and I get to lay all the crown, one or five or 55. I have no idea, probably one or two. I get to turn and then lay at Jesus' feet. I get to give him some, and it doesn't come close to touching what he deserves. But I get to give him something in honor for the one who gave everything for me. Now, here's the thing. If everything we've built on that foundation is wood, hay, and stubble, if it's all burned up, then guess what? We're saved, but we get to stand there and watch everybody else bring something to the feet of Jesus, and we have nothing to give to the one that deserves everything. For me, that's what I dread. That's what I fear, that I'm not going to have anything to offer the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So I want to make sure that I am building on that foundation that I have laid in Jesus Christ with something that will last, something of value. Eddie mentioned it this weekend in our marriage conference. We had a marriage conference this weekend. It was so much fun. And Eddie mentioned it this weekend, and I'll mention it today. Listen, parents, what are we helping our children build? Are all the things that we do outside the walls of the church important? Yeah. But are we helping them not only to do things that are fun, things that are act sports are great, bands great, all those things, they're great. You should do them but not at the expense of building something that will last. Not at the expense of teaching them what's really important. Because at the end of the day, all the sports are going to burn up. All the band stuff's going to burn up. What will we have left? Paul said all that stuff will be wasted. It'll be wasted. And then Paul moves to the work that is wiped out. And he says first, hey, you are the temple. You are the temple. And we talked about what that means, but he says it. Now here in this passage, I want you to know, everybody, we think about you are the temple. We think about that as an individual thing, right? I'm the temple. You're the temple. Individual thing. That's not what Paul is saying here. Now, when we get to 1 Corinthians 6, Paul is talking about you, the temple, as an individual. But here he's not. Here he is talking about you plural. So he is talking about this, uh, this emphasis on the church as a whole. So he is talking about you are the temple. You are the church. Big C, everybody in Christ is a part. That's what he's talking about. This should be our favorite passage as Southerners. It really should, because here's how it should be translated. I'm surprised the New Living Translation doesn't translate it this way that we read, but here's how it should be translated. Hey, y'all, don't y'all know that y'all are the temple? That's really how it should be translated. You know why? Because that's what he's saying. He's saying, hey, this is not an individual thing. We all, y'all all are the temple. You are the temple. And it is important for you to see yourselves as the temple. Because here's why it's really important. Because he goes on to say, if anyone defiles the church, if anyone defiles the temple, 
not talking about you individually. He's talking about the church. If somebody comes in and tries to defile my children, my church, my temple, you know what they should be done? They should be destroyed. Pretty strong language, huh? They should be destroyed. And what Paul's talking about here is false teachers. He's talking about false teachers. Because remember, Paul tells them earlier, listen, if anybody comes to you preaching another gospel, other than what I've already taught, right? If anybody comes, even me, even if I come preaching it, they should be put out. They, you shouldn't hear them. And now he says, listen, if they come preaching something else, they should be destroyed. Because I won't let anything defile my church, my temple, my children. Do we realize how many cults have been started and they started out on the right foundation? And then somebody came along and they started building on that foundation. It was just a little thing, just a little thing here, a little thing there. And before long, it is some, Jesus is not even mentioned. And the focus becomes on someone or something earthly. It, it, is, it is when somebody defiles the temple, when they get up and say, hey, there is, uh, there is Jesus is a way, right? But there, there's other ways. We are all going to, God's a loving God, so we're all going to go to heaven one day. The reality is, yes, God is a loving God. He loves us so much that he made a way. But without that way, you won't see eternal life. He said, I am the way, not a way. I am the truth, not a truth. And I am the life. No one, I don't care who you are, I don't care who your mama is, I don't care who your daddy is, I don't care what denomination you're a part of, I don't care. No one gets to the Father except through me. It's not up for debate. Right? It's just, it's not up for debate. And when you preach something other than that, you're preaching a false doctrine. And Paul says you should be destroyed because I'm not going to let anybody hurt my temple, my church, my children. Listen, for us, that should, that should, if you're a child of God, man, that should get you fired up because God wants to protect us. God wants to make sure that we are, on, we are building on the firm foundation and we are pointing people to Jesus and he will not let anything hinder that. <clears throat> he said, um, the, even the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Won't do it. And he says, so, if we're gonna, if we're gonna have this foundation and we're gonna build on it with the right things, what's the true glory of God? Well, finally, he says, when you boast in the Lord, when you boast in the Lord, that's the true glory of God. Boasting in men is too narrow. Boasting in men is too narrow. We can, we can even boast in what God has done in somebody. And if that's all we boast about, it's too narrow. But if we boast in the Lord, the things of the Lord, the things the Lord has done, Paul says the world is yours in Christ. Now think about that for a second. The world is yours in Christ. If you've built on the foundation of Jesus Christ, and you've built the right way, the right things on that foundation, then the world is yours. And he goes on to say, even life and death is yours. So let's, let's talk about that for a second. Let's talk about death for a second. And you say, well, if death is mine, I don't want to die. Well, that's not what he means. Then what does he mean by death is yours? Well, here's the thing. It's like, you remember Acts 12 um, Peter is in chains in prison. Peter's in chains in prison. And an angel comes and touches the chains and they fall off. And then Peter walks out the door in complete freedom. In complete freedom. So I was thinking about this and, and Patrick alluded to it in his prayer. But you know, most of y'all know if you don't, Patrick's mom passed away on Friday morning. And Miss Janice, I was so glad she got here two weeks ago, sat right there and listened to her baby boy preach. And I was thinking about that, and I thought, you know what? If you ever watched her worship, Miss Janice, Miss Janice was a free worshiper. <laughs> like, she had freedom in worship. She loved worship, and she was free. She didn't care who was watching her. She's going to worship, right? 
But the moment, because she was in Christ, the moment that she passed away, it was like change dropping off. She, for the first time in her life, didn't just have freedom in worship. She had complete freedom in the presence of Jesus. That's what Paul's talking about. It's yours in Christ. This morning, we, we can think, oh, listen, I, I need to do better because I'm afraid that what I've been building is, is not been built in a worthy manner. I'm afraid that what I've been building, and we can say, you know, I don't know what to do. Well, God made a way. What you have to do is say, God, my heart is that I want to serve you and you only, and I want to do it with the right in the right heart, the right motivation, for the right reason. I want to build something lasting for the kingdom. And you know what? Just like that, he will help you. Because he's, he's not sitting up there going, well, you should have thought about that earlier. That's what I would do. <laughs> not God. There, there are people in this room today who you do still, no matter how much we tell you, no matter how much we sing about it, no matter what we do, you still don't believe you're worthy of God's love. Well, I got news for you. You're not. That's what grace is. But he gives it to you anyway. You don't have to be worthy of it. You just have to accept it. Whatever you have to do, whatever, you, whatever you know, stuff in your past that you have to let go, whatever you have to do to just say, God, I'm not worthy, but that's okay. I'm going to accept the love that you give me. He will allow you to start building on the foundation in the right way. Now, there are some of you who can't build the right way because you don't have a foundation. That if something happened to you, if you passed from this life, you don't know where you'd be. Or you do know where you'd be. And it's not heaven. It's separated from God for all eternity. There is freedom waiting for you. You don't have to fear death. You don't have to fear life. You don't have to fear anything. You know why? There's freedom waiting for you in Christ. If you build, if you lay the foundation in Christ and you start to build on it for the kingdom and for his glory. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today and we thank you for your love and your grace. And God, we thank you that um, even when we don't deserve it, you love us. Even when we can't feel it, you love us. God, I pray that... um, this morning, as, as people have heard your word, God, that you would move in power, that if there's someone here who does not have a foundation laid in Christ, that before they leave this room, they will get that settled for you. But God, for those who are in the room and, and they've just been going through the most, just checking off church because it's just something on the list, God, they would focus in on God, how do I serve you better tomorrow? How do I build something lasting on that foundation? How do I lead my family to build something lasting on that foundation? God, my prayer is that we won't waste our lives with stuff that doesn't matter. We would surrender. we ask that you do all all the things that you can do in this place and you get the glory in Jesus name we pray amen let's stand together we're going to sing prayer team is in the back Um, I'll be up here if you'd like to take communion it's up front Um, there's a place to kneel if you want to come and kneel and pray there's a place to do that Um, but whatever God's laid on your heart this morning If you need to pray for salvation, if you need to pray to to be a better uh, leader of your household so that you can teach your family what it means to build something lasting, this is the time for you as we see. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior that cursed tree his 
his body bound and drenched in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah Jesus. 